I'm Robert Lomax, and I'm going to talk to you about how you can help your children achieve their full potential in their 11 plus and 13 plus exams for grammar or independent schools. If you've been asking the advice of everybody you know, trawling the web for past papers, wondering how many thousands of pounds to spend on a private tutor, hang on a second. Take a deep breath. Make a cup of tea. Because over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you some totally practical advice which will help you prepare your children for success with the absolute minimum of worry. In this three video series, I'm going to focus on dealing with the topics which you asked for in my recent survey. The number one request was for advice about developing comprehension technique, and I'll be discussing that in video two, along with an effective approach to maths practice. Building writing skills wasn't far behind. I'll talk about that today. And one overriding concern was how to help your children with topics that you aren't confident about yourself. That's going to be the overall focus of videos one and two. I'll also deal with many of the other topics you asked for, and I'll be doing a roundup of your unanswered questions in the final video. I'm going to help you find an overall approach to helping your children learn. And towards the end of this course, I'm going to talk about how you can structure a study plan to make success achievable without stress. By watching these videos, you will, I hope, develop a clearer idea of how to help your children along without spending all your savings and getting swallowed up by panic. And over this video series, you'll acquire a really clear set of tools which you and your family can use right away. As well as answering your questions, I'm going to show you some of the best techniques for success which I've developed over many years and thousands of hours of teaching with children of all abilities. I can't promise that every child will get into the school of their choice. I can promise that if you and your child take these simple ideas and methods on board, they will be better equipped to show themselves at their very best and make the most of the talents they have. I know that's a big claim to make, but there's no magic involved. I've learned that there are a few core skills which apply across the board and that the best methods for learning these skills can help almost anybody perform well in tests. And when people have a clear idea of how to achieve what they want to, even the most insecure and self-doubting people can find the confidence to turn their academic lives around. That's why I started writing educational books and why I founded RSL Educational. In this video, I'm going to show you how, with a few simple techniques, you can make a huge difference for your child, whether or not you choose to use my materials. You might be thinking this is too good to be true. Too simple. Well, none of it's simple, but all of it is achievable by you and your family, and if you go about it the right way, it can be transformative. With a bit of effort, if it's focused on the right things, and especially if the work is enjoyable, it's pretty amazing what a young person can achieve. Now, far too much education is about children doing work, handing it in and getting a mark back. What they need is a way to understand their own work, to become skilled at identifying the strengths and weaknesses in their answers so they're empowered to direct their own learning. I spent years telling children how to write things, how to structure a comprehension answer, how to make a start with a maths question, how to write a good story. And sometimes they got the idea straight away. But quite often they didn't. And however many times I went back and told them again and again and again, some children just didn't get it at all. Ever. It seemed that even my clearest, my very best explanations just didn't make sense however hard I worked to make them better. Then, in frustration, I know that's not a good reason, I started doing the work for them. Look, give me the pen and watch. This is how you do it. And, almost like magic, they started to get it. And I thought, could this be the solution I've been looking for? So I began carrying model answers around with me. Look, I'd say, here's one I wrote earlier. I'd ask the student to compare their answer with the example I brought and explain the differences, how theirs could be better, how mine could be better. 
For a while, this was great. My students started to do better in school. More importantly, they were starting to think about their work more critically, more objectively. But over time, I realised that some of the magic of those earlier lessons, when I'd worked alongside my students, had gone. I kept trying. Maybe I just had to focus on comparing our answers more effectively. Perhaps I could make games out of it, find ways to create a sense of competition. But it wasn't enough. So I put my pre-written answers away. More and more often, I wrote my answers alongside the student while they worked. Even if this meant I wrote an answer to the same question for three different people on the same day and went home feeling I never wanted to look at it again in my life. And it worked, just like the first time. This was what I'd been missing. I had to work at the same time as the child, while they worked. If my answer was elegant and well written, straight away the child had something to imitate. But, and this is the really important thing, if I was tired and a bit bored and I let a mistake or two slip through, I hadn't explained a quote clearly or, this is pretty terrible, I'd forgotten the units at the end of a maths question. This was even better. They pounced on it triumphantly. If I could get it wrong, they realised, then obviously I didn't have superhuman skills after all. And in that case, surely they could produce brilliant work for themselves. But above all else, by correcting and improving my answers, they learnt how to improve and develop their work far better than they ever had before. This was great for comprehension, great for maths, and absolutely fantastic for essays and stories. And this, taking the time, just sometimes, to work with your child, is the core of the method I'm going to be showing you. But there's a lot more to it, so stick around a while longer. Now I guess you're thinking that this is all very well for a tutor, who probably knows well enough how to write answers for school tests. But what if you don't have a clue how to answer comprehension questions? You've never written a story in your life. You're terrified of maths. How do you help your child if you worry that you know even less about these things than they do? Well, don't go away. This approach is possibly even more useful for you than it would be for an experienced tutor. Let's look at an example. I know that some 11 plus tests don't include creative writing, but it's a great way to introduce the concept and 13 plus exams virtually always include writing. And anyway, it's really important to develop these skills, whether or not they're for an exam. Imagine a situation where a tutor sets the following five minute writing task. Describe a ruined city at sunset. The student writes this. All the stones were red, because of the red sunset, which made them stand out. It wasn't warm anymore, it was quite cold. The sea was loud and quite frightening. The city was very broken, and I don't think anybody lived there anymore. We decided to go because a wall fell and a piece hit me on the head. We have a sandwich and then get back in the car. There were quite a few things I might say about this straight away, but how many of them would actually sink in? Well. Here are a few of them, and you can decide for yourself. For a start, the students imagine the scene very well. They've obviously worked hard to see it in their head, and this comes across in the writing. Of course, they've made several mistakes in the spelling and grammar, and I'd have to point all of them out. More importantly, I talk to the child about how they could develop their ideas more, to help the reader imagine the scene, rather than just telling them what it was like, with words like red, cold and broken. And what about the wall that fell on them? That seems to come out of nowhere. And then they sat down for a sandwich as though nothing had happened. And so on. But that's just a list of instructions and criticisms, most of it negative, and many children would forget the whole lot within a few minutes. But how do you come up with ideas? They might very well ask. I want to know how. Well, I might say, have a look at what I wrote while you were working, and this might help you understand. And then, 
Unfortunately, as you'll see, I show them what I wrote. The sun was setting, drenching everything, including the remains of a Roman aqueduct which stood among the dunes that had engulfed what remained of the ancient city in a brilliant ochreous yellow light. Waves were breaking over the remnants of the ancient harbour works, and down on the foreshore where the air was full of flying spume, a man on a camel, dressed in rags which were streaming in the wind, was the only other human being in sight. And the student, being very polite, of course, says, wow, that's brilliant. How do you do that? But what they're really thinking, probably, is, I could never do something like that. There's no point even trying. And that's why this method does not work best when it comes from a brilliant writer. Like Eric Newby, who actually wrote that because I certainly don't want to imply that I'm a better writer than you are, or that any other tutor necessarily is. But the point is that showing children beautiful work as an example has limited value. They need to be able to engage with a teacher's work by comparing it to their own and finding room for improvement in both. Ideally, there will be a few areas in which their piece is better. And this is why you don't need to be a confident writer or a mathematician or a literary critic to help your child in this way. The best value comes when they recognise that writing is not about being wrong or right, but about taking the best features of their work and your work and the mistakes and learning from both. Now, let's look at a less skillful passage than Eric Newby's. It's a passage that an adult with no special practice as a writer might come up with a response to the same question and see how that could be far more useful when we put it alongside the child's work. Here we go. It took her a while to see that they were ruins. But then Mary realised that it was the skeleton of a house. One house. Two. Three. A hundred. She felt scared. All around her, these hillocks had once been alive. She could almost smell the scents of a city as the orange light sank across it like a lid, and she imagined thousands of fires burning. As she imagined the fires, she imagined that the fog was their smoke. This is a nice bit of writing. It uses a character well to draw us into the scene, and there are some good descriptions. But there are also lots of things a child might pick up on and even criticise. And by doing this, they learn really important lessons for their own writing. Here are some of the comments I might expect to get from a thoughtful 10 or 11 year old. How did Mary realise it was a house? Why didn't she notice before? Was it covered in something perhaps like moss or grass? Wouldn't a skeleton be pretty complete? Maybe bones would be a better word to describe something this ruined. One, two, three, a hundred. This works really well because it shows her looking around and trying to count. We can really see into her head. That's something I could try. Hillux is missing an L. Why did she feel scared? That seems to come out of nowhere and it doesn't really make sense. Is she imagining dead people underneath her maybe? Shouldn't there be a full stop after the sense of a city? I really like the idea of using smell like that. I'll do it next time. Would a lid sink slowly and cover a large area? Wouldn't a tablecloth or a bedsheet make more sense? Even a shroud if you want to be gloomy. The last sentence repeats the previous phrase, and it uses the word imagined a lot. How about linking the sentences like this? She imagined thousands of fires burning and that the fog was their smoke. Of course, some of those points are debatable. And in a way, that's the point. 
What matters is that it's far easier to question someone else's work than your own, especially when there's the opportunity to pick holes in something written by your mother or father. And children usually discover that, having found ways to improve somebody else's work, it suddenly, almost miraculously, becomes easy to start applying the same lessons to their own writing. By the way, I'm certainly not saying that you shouldn't point out your child's mistakes and correct their grammar and spelling. But the lessons which really sink in will be the ones they discover themselves, perhaps with the odd hint or nudge in the early days. And these might include the kind of ideas I've been underlining in this passage. Now, of course, I wouldn't expect most 10 or 11 year olds to see all those things. But if they spot even one thing which they think they could do better than you, they will learn to find ways to improve their own writing as well. And, what's more, they'll realise that they are much better than they thought they were. And because they don't have a sense that everything in your work is amazing, it's easier for them to notice the good things and copy them. So the lesson's this. Sometimes, from time to time, work alongside your child, especially if you lack confidence yourself. The less good your writing is, the easier it will be for your child to suggest improvements, and the more they will learn. In other words, the less you are like a professional teacher, the better. By saving money on a tutor, you're also, in some ways, providing an even better education for your child. You might be wondering how these lessons can be applied to maths and to comprehension. You're probably also wondering how to structure exam preparation over a period of months, as I mentioned, and where to start. You probably have other questions too. And then, there's the elephant in the room. Because I guess you're thinking, I have a busy enough life as it is. How on earth do I find enough time to do my child's exam practice alongside my own work as well? Well, don't worry. I'll be dealing with all these things in the next two videos. Thanks for watching. If you found something useful in this video, please write a comment below. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Write it in the comments. I'll do my best to reply to every single comment and to give useful advice whenever I can. I'll see you for the next video.